I'm Glenn McGuinness and welcome to Outburst. This week, Canadians reflect on the tremendous sacrifices made a century ago. The amazing thing, I think, is that so many Canadians enlisted. About 500,000 voluntarily, another 120,000 were conscripted. It was an incredible exertion from a young country. And we explore what November 11th means today for citizens and soldiers. I'm Molly Thomas in Toronto. Ryerson Mabey served three tours with the Canadian military, first in Bosnia, then in Afghanistan. Today, he shares his story of sacrifice, duty and resilience. We have that story coming up. Tens of thousands of Canadian soldiers died in the First World War. Hundreds of thousands more returned wounded or shell-shocked. It changed the world, and Canada was no exception. 100 years later, how much do Canadians know about the Great War, our country's role in it, and how it all ended on November 11th, 1918? They know about the First World War. They know about Vimy. They know about that April 1917 battle. They know because we built the monument there. But most historians would say that these battles, the 100 days, are the most important of the First World War. I'm Dr. Tim Cook. I'm a historian at the Canadian War Museum, and we're in the new exhibition, Victory 1918. Victory 1918 is our capstone exhibition, and it explores the role of the Canadian Corps in the final 100 days campaign. And these are a series of battles that ended the First World War. These 96 days of battle proved and showed that the Canadian Corps was an elite fighting force, but it was victory won at a terrible cost, almost 45,000 casualties during that period. We raised 630,000 Canadians to serve in the war. That's one in three adult males. This is a war where Canada stepped up, stood shoulder to shoulder with Britain. And yet the extremity of the war effort also nearly tore the country apart. The conscription crisis of 1917 was a devastating event and it pitted English against French, community against community. When Britain went to war, Canada was automatically at war. We had no say over the matter. And I think as we move towards Remembrance Day and the 100th anniversary, it's a time to reflect on both the service and sacrifice of Canadians throughout the many wars that have shaped our country. Why is it important to remember the First World War? It was supposed to be the war that was supposed to end all wars and it didn't work. So if we don't remember that one and the promises we made to ourselves as a people and as world, then um, it reminds us how fragile it all is. It's part of uh, our history and it's what makes us Canadian. I think it's really important for youth today and just people of younger generations to know uh, some of the experiences that maybe their grandparents lived through and I think it makes us stronger as a nation to kind of know some of the mistakes we've made in the past so that we don't repeat them in today's political landscape. For me, it's important to remember World War I and World War II because my family, I'm Jewish and my family comes from Europe and we were, of course, our people were severely impacted and it started, it started back then. And so um, to thank all the people who gave their lives and put their lives on the line to help people in need, like my ancestors, is very important. For our Canadian country, we had men, uh, fierce, brave men, that went out to war to that to fight almost the world, you know, with allies and, and enemies, and uh, they sacrificed their life for us. And um, honestly, we wouldn't be here today with a beautiful country like this if it wasn't for those men. So many people lost their lives. Um, it's a huge loss to humanity. And um, yeah, I mean, it's that it's remember the. It makes the, uh, the leaders remember that we should not do these sort of things again uh, in the future. I mean, uh, the way humanity was destroyed by the leaders and, um, yeah, those arrogant persons, yeah, it's, it's important to remember and, and identify those who are, uh, you know, creating these sort of things again and uh, are trying to put uh, the world in a war again. The World War One's a complicated one because it was not a war that people remember as being, uh, you know, saving our freedoms and things like that. But it's important for the sacrifice. A lot of young Canadian men and women went off and, and fought for a, a very complicated cause. I mean, my own grandfather was over there in the trenches as an artillery man. Um, 
it's important because it you know set a pattern for his life that was perhaps not a positive one um, but uh, it's important the sacrifice that people made who was prime minister of canada during world war one it was sir borden or james borden i'm pretty sure no wow <laughs> i do not know i can't answer that give me a guess a guess I know the first uh, Prime Minister was John A. McDonald's, so seeing that's the only name I know, I'm going to go with John A. McDonald's. I'm going to need the three guesses. Your choices are? Yeah. Sir Wilfrid Laurier. Yeah. R.B. Bennett. Yeah. Sir Robert Borden. I'm going to say Sir Robert Borden. I think it's Laurier. I think it was Robert Borden. You are absolutely correct, sir. Thank you. Good. Very good. Thank you so much. Canada's eighth Prime Minister, Sir Robert Borden, held the office from 1911 to 1920. Borden is best known for his leadership during the First World War. He implemented the War Measures Act in 1914, which gave unprecedented control to the federal cabinet ministers to arrest, detain, and deport people, censor and ban publications, and seize private property. The Military Service Act of 1917, which introduced military conscription, is perhaps the most controversial of Borden's wartime measures. It would bitterly divide the country. As Prime Minister, Robert Borden also advocated for Canada to have more control over its own foreign policy and foreign relations. He would send Canadian representatives to the 1919 Paris Peace Conference and made sure Canada signed the Treaty of Versailles. When should Canadian troops be deployed? When our Prime Minister agrees and when our allies uh, uh, deem it appropriate to do. We are uh, uh, coupled with other nations to protect everyone. That's a tough question for me, being a, a combat veteran. When we're directed to, when we need to be there for others. That could be a number of different reasons. It, it could, but as soldiers, we do as we're directed, and that's our job. And we're there for the safety of others and those that can't defend themselves. I think never. If and whenever they're needed. Unrest and, and, and lack of democracy in countries, and I think our, our, our nation should, should participate globally wherever we can help establish peace and calm for the citizens of the world. I would like Canada to do its best to support the UN and any of those international type things that we're trying to um, band together for human justice and peace. Like it's, it's a really fine line. I think we really need to have like a page about this long of criteria to meet because we're risking our soldiers' lives too. And we should treat them with the respect that they're due. And I'm not sure that always happens. Peacekeeping missions, where that's kind of what we've been known for, continue with peacekeeping, not start anything. I mean, I didn't agree with Afghanistan, that's for sure. We shouldn't have been involved. I've got a nine-year-old son. Always crosses my mind what went through my grandparents' mind when their son went to World War II. I don't know. I don't want my kid, kids, daughter, boys. I don't want any of them to go. I don't want war. It's stupid. It's wrong. Anytime they're asked to. Um, it, it's a necessary evil now. Um, this world is going crazy, so uh, whenever we're asked to do it, I think they should go. And I think it's probably maybe when we might have uh, civilians there in another country, or if they're an ally. Um, I know Canada's troops are not as strong as Americans, but you know, like we do have good troops, and maybe we can enable them whenever they're engaged. I think uh, anytime there's any kind of conflict where there needs to be some peace, because Canada is kind of one of the world leaders in uh, moving forward and trying to keep peace. So I think whenever something like some kind of conflict needs to be resolved. Yeah, I agree when necessary, of course. Despite educational programs, national memorial services, or massive exhibits like this one, a recent survey found that 56% of Canadians did not know that 2018 marked 100 years since the end of the First World War. The poppy, however, remains an important symbol of the war and the famous Canadian poem in which it features. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. Today, the poppy is a symbol for all of those 
who have fought in conflict on Canada's behalf. The Royal Canadian Legion will distribute some 20 million poppies with donations going to help veterans and their families. This year, you can personalize your own digital poppy, tell a personal story, or dedicate it on someone's behalf. So now it's your turn. Do you have a personal story to put on a poppy? And what does this symbol mean to you? The poppy is uh, the symbol um, to acknowledge our debt to the soldiers and to the people who have uh, given their lives and given uh, of their lives for those who come back injured and otherwise um, uh, prejudiced by their efforts in order to uh, ensure that we have the liberties and the freedoms that we have. You know, I have a small daughter, she's eight years old, and I think, you know, the future that she has ahead of her is thanks to those, those folks that, that gave their way for this kind of thing. I just actually came back from Germany and uh, I was in Berlin and I saw the, the Holocaust Memorial. So to think of how many people lost their lives both in the Holocaust and in World War II. And I'm just very grateful to the soldiers that helped us live the, have the freedom and the life that we have today. It means a lot of things. It means sacrifice, um, humility, the remembrance, those that perished, the real heroes. It means a, it means a lot of different things. Like, I, it, it, It's a hard thing to put into words, to be honest with you. I think it means uh, people that have sacrificed their lives. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it also, see to me, you know, this Western idea of other countries that need saving. And like I come from, I'm a Muslim woman whose parents immigrated from one of these countries. So this Western idea that these countries need saving, um, oftentimes with a hidden agenda of exploitation, um, I, I don't mean to belittle the people that sacrifice their lives, but I mean, a lot of times I think it's unjustified. And I think that's, those are lives that could have been um, prevented. And some, oftentimes, you know, war always does more harm than good. Um, so I mean, I mean, you know, growing up in the West, we celebrate the poppies, it's a very Western tradition, but I mean, it's very one-sided. Remembering, uh, it's not easy. War is not easy at all. And uh, we're very blessed that we don't have to fight war every day because of the people who put their lives down all over the world every day. Not just today, not just yesterday. Remembrance Day should be every day. Uh, it's just, it's just kind of like, uh, Remembrance Day itself is just to remind people but, uh, you know, looking around and not hearing bombs drop on our houses and stuff like that should be enough of a remembrance. I think what uh, Poppy means to me is that um, those of us who never served show that we appreciate the uh, commitment and sacrifice that those who did serve made on our behalf. Uh, wearing a Poppy shows that uh, we remember and, and we appreciate and we won't forget. It's my first time in Canada and I'm very glad to be here, especially during the Remembrance Day. And before I came here, I had no idea about the poppy, but when I came here, I saw everybody uh, putting this flower on their chest. So uh, after, afterwards, when I studied from my teacher that this has a very significant role for the Canadians, it's a symbol of uh, uh, how Canadians respect the, uh, the fallen soldiers, uh, remembering uh, the uh, remembering about their uh, you know sacrifice they have given to Canada, so I'm very glad to be one of the Canadians and wear this right now to respect uh, the fallen soldiers. It's like honoring those who went to war and fought for our country and like you know gave us all of our freedom and it's sorry it's it's something that we can have to remember them by and respect what they did. Yeah, we have the poppy in Australia as well and it's just something, again, something to remember the fallen, uh, a, a sign of respect and yeah, just uh, yeah, remembering their sacrifice for us. We are in an exchange with militaries in, in Canada yep. and they teach us that the uh, poppy flower is uh, so representative of Remembrance Day that 
represents all of the soldiers that have fallen in war, in special wars during the time. Well, this pin was from my grandfather, who fought in the war. So he wore his poppy like this, so I wear mine like this. When people think of Remembrance Day, they often think of World War I and II vets, but it is also significant for every soldier that has served since then. I had a chance to speak with Ryerson Maybe. He is a captain in the primary reserve of the Queen York Rangers. He, he has served in tours in Bosnia as well as in Afghanistan, and he shared with me both the triumphs and the tragedy of serving our country. Um, so this is my granddad when he was uh, a captain and serving in Italy in uh, World War II. I first met Ryerson in 2015 through mutual friends. I had no idea he had served our country for more than two decades or that he had a rich family history of fighting for freedom. Dad's dad and mom's dad. And then this is me. Wow. And so yeah, it took a while, but I caught up to granddad. And so when you get to Bosnia, I mean, you're, you're young, you're, you're, you're stepping into a very uh, hostile place. Uh, what was that like for you? I was quite young, I was 22. And I, I remember a friend of mine had made me a mixtape so I'm dating myself here, uh, that I was listening to on my Sony Sports Walkman. Um, we, we landed by a plane in Zagreb, and then we boarded buses to bus down into Bosnia proper. And uh, on the way, we had to go through the zone of separation, which is where a lot of the fighting had taken place. And it was at nighttime, and we were on a really tight bus, and I was listening to my Walkman, and uh, the Talking Heads, Life During Wartime came on. Um, that was on the mixtape. Mm -hmm. And it was the perfect song to go through that particular stretch of turf, um, ever and so that memory is forever etched in my mind you know middle class white kid from toronto um, uh, with all of the altruistic notions that that entails uh, goes overseas and I mean, never mind the destruction caused by the war but the poverty mm -hmm. and the different standard of living um, were very eye-opening and it reinforced something that my father had said to me when the iran hostage crisis was going which is that uh, I was very lucky to have been born in Canada and that I was very lucky to be Canadian. Um, and that was extremely evident uh, when we were patrolling Bosnia. And you did two tours in Bosnia. You went to Afghanistan then in 2010. Yeah. Um, you're much older with experience. Uh, how do you look at those things differently? Do you look at it differently? Do you walk into a country differently? Um, yes. So the it, it's interesting because the one of the things that we talk about in the military a lot is um, uh, first tour angries. So when you come home, generally, uh, a lot of people who've just come back from their first rotation tend to be a little bit more angry with the world uh, than your average person. Mm -hmm. um, and a friend of mine who had also deployed to Bosnia, but when the shooting war was on, um, uh, we were in a bar one night and uh, he just unprompted and out of nowhere turned to me and said, so went to Bosnia, thought you saved the world, come home. Nobody cares, and I was like, "Oh, oh, yeah, that's that's why I'm so that's why I'm so mad." And uh, because for us, going on tour is is uh, if not the culmination, it's certainly uh, a, a, a career achievement because mm -hmm. uh, you're testing your skills that you've practiced again and again and again for real in an operational environment where there are real consequences to failure uh, and real consequences to success. So, and then. The military esteems tours very highly. Uh, individual soldiers esteem tours very highly. And then you come home and like your parents are happy they're in one piece, but that's pretty much the end of it. Um, so, which was good because when I went on tour number two and I was in command of younger soldiers who were on their first tours, I was able to say, hey, like when you get home, this is probably what's gonna happen. Um, just remember that the fact that you went and did this thing that you think is really important doesn't mean that everybody else thinks it's really important. What would you say to Canadians about about the soldiers, maybe not only from the early wars, but but the younger guys, that younger men and women? Uh, the, the world needs more Canada. Um, I've worked with the Brits, the Americans, the Belgians, the Dutch, um, and soldier for soldier, ours are the best there are. We're all volunteers. The vast majority of us actually care about making a difference and actually care about the environment that we're in. So, you know, we try to learn the, lo the local language. So, yeah, I would want Canadians to know that they're well represented when we go overseas um, by all the members of the Canadian Forces. So now, I guess, as you sit and, and you take in Remembrance Day from here in Canada, 
Um, what does it mean to you? Uh, I think about um, Gilles Desmarais, Jim Ogilvy, Danny Hodges, Tom Eckner. Um, those are all soldiers that I served with who uh, Gilles and Jim died on my first tour. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't get the, the Highway of Heroes because um, that sort of predated that. And then, of course, I think about all the casualties that I helped repatriate um, from Afghanistan. I think about standing on the ramp um, at Kandahar Airfield and on the ramp at Trenton. Um, that's, what I, that's what I think about. And then to a lesser extent, but um, with no less gravity, I think about the sacrifices my grandfather's made. Um, my mom's dad was overseas for six years uh, in way more difficult circumstances than I've ever faced. It's a bittersweet kind of day because you think about the people we've lost, but you also think about all that we've accomplished and um, that the world's uh, at least marginally better uh, than it might have been if we hadn't done what we've done. Canada's long struggled to understand how we serve the men and women that come home from war zones, with everything from treating shell shock to understanding suicide to tackling unemployment to even just paying respects. Today, there are ongoing funding issues when it comes to taking care of veterans that have served our country. And so we want to know from you, what do you think? How can we best serve our veterans? Um, I don't know too much about like how veterans are treated. But I, I, I don't know, I'm wearing the coffee because I've been taught and I've seen videos of how like, Canadians sacrifice themselves. And I'm from Hong Kong, so I know their sacrifice to the people they don't even know. And I know thousands of lives are lost. And, uh, so that's why I'm wearing it, but I don't know too much about no, that's how okay. parents treat it. That's okay. And what did you choose to wear the poppy? I mean, are you also from uh, abroad somewhere? I'm from here. You're from here. Okay. So Remembrance Day, what does it mean for you? Uh, it just means appreciating all the sacrifices that a brave men and women have made and um, like, honored this country and for freedom. And wearing this poppy just means like honoring that and remembering the sacrifices they made and that it didn't go in vain. Um, what my mind goes straight to is like mental health and especially veterans okay. coming back from war and what they go through in terms of PTSD, just trying to serve them better in terms of that. Um, otherwise, I can't really think of anything else. Yeah, I think it's just like, maybe like better treatment or like, because I feel like a lot of people understand what they've been through because they didn't actually been through what they went through. So like, I agree with what you said earlier, like about the mental health and just like really be, be like considerate about like, because it's a lot for them. I used to work for the province. Uh, there's some work that's still being done to support the, the veterans and uh, I don't think that they're uh, remembered well enough or supported to the fullest extent uh, that we can actually support them. I mean, these people put their lives on the line for us, right? And uh, they left their families behind just for us and for our families. So, uh, yeah, it means a little bit more to me now because I'm a bit older uh, and I know what having nothing feels like. So I'm very, you know, grateful to them for giving me something. Every day. Still pretty much new to Canada. I'm still on the PR. But yeah, I see like people wearing this poppy, so mm -hmm. that is for the Remembrance Day. I think it's a nice gesture that Canadian people are kind of buying those poppies and kind of donating money. But I think the government should also put some more money and do more for the veterans because uh, we are here, we are free because of them. That's what I feel. They need more money and more help because that's all you hear about in the news is the people are on welfare, they're on this, they're on that. And that in Canada, that shouldn't be. Not when we sent all those troops over to World War I. They've earned their, their pay. And they should also be justify, justifiably paid. It makes me sick when I see veterans, like they, they're like homeless, you know, they have no rights, they have no, well, not that they don't have no rights, but they have no like support from the government you know, for what they did and they should, they should be rewarded, you know? Give them what they ask for, basically. I don't think they're asking for too much, especially if somebody's been really hurt where they're wounded permanently for life. Help them out, really, do the right thing. They're good people, they deserve it. I think it's all like psychology. Psychology? Yeah, yeah, thanks. And uh, like uh, treatments and everything because they, they're going to war, so they're like, they made up their mind and after that it's like their family and everything. It's not even just a Canadian problem, it's just a general problem with how the West treats its veterans. They get the short end of the stick and they typically don't get what they're promised in the long run. 
and it's it's pretty horrendous in my opinion how it goes it's really inefficient really poorly sourced if they actually have more conversations with vets themselves uh, I think there should be more people that they can access to be able to tell them what problems they're having. Uh, I think the government could do a lot better with that. Uh, I definitely think we aren't doing as much as we should be. There's, I mean, we should be taking care of their health concerns, the fact that we can't even get our food bank donations to be as good as they need to be, especially last year this was a big issue. And I think it's just about the lack of awareness, especially in youth. World War I veterans returned to Canada with a trauma previously unknown to a country that had just faced dramatic changes. The French and English were deeply divided over conscription. Canada was in death. Women were voting. An economic downturn left thousands without jobs, and the House of Commons was destroyed by fire. But out of this chaos, a remarkable vision. A place for debate and democracy. A place for Canadians to call their own and a place of remembrance for those lost during wartime. On November 12th, CPAC presents Inside Centre Block. Everything in this building relates to the heritage and history of Parliament as an institution. Welcome to my office. Come on in. Let's have a look. In the series Inside Centre Block, we go into spaces that maybe Canadians haven't seen. I'm Catherine Christie Luff, and I'm a producer of a five part documentary series, Inside Centre Block. Centre Block will be closed for over a decade for the biggest rehabilitation program um, ever undertaken in Canada. So we would like to open the doors of Centre Block for Canadians to see inside, um, to see the beauty, to see the grandeur, to see the art, to see the architecture. And also we tell you a little bit about the traditions as well. The original Parliament buildings burnt down in February 1916. So we were in the midst of the First World War then. So when we rebuilt Parliament buildings, when we rebuilt Centre Block, um, it was very much connected to the First World War. The memorial chamber in the Peace Tower has long been regarded as the heart of the Peace Tower. It really is the most beautiful and poignant uh, space. It's there to remind us of those who have served. It was originally constructed um, in honor of those who died in the First World War. It is steeped in remembrance and sacrifice. And it's hard not to visit the place without feeling really touched. I'm Glenn McGuinness. On behalf of all my colleagues at the Cable Public Affairs Channel, thanks for watching this week's episode of Outburst. Here's a little bit of what you'll see next week. Thanks for coming in the rain, you guys. The, the most experience I have with farming is we went to a pumpkin patch. It's a shrinking economy in terms of the number of active uh, farmers. I think they need more benefits for like when you have bad seasons and because it's always hit and miss if they're going to make their uh, budget for the year. We can just make stuff, you know, in labs. So I guess the farming future could be good, could be bad. There's a lot of land reserved for farming. And uh, I don't know if it's all used accordingly. When you have a relationship with land and you see how much we share it with so many beings and how many people we feed, then to think of us not having it or not fighting for it is emotional. <laughs>